Jason, welcome to my podcast. I am very, very honored to talk to you today about such an important topic and how you have gone through such a such an issue, such a massive thing and how you've turned this around in your life to help others. So before we start, people have heard a little bit about your bio, but can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do and why you do yep. it? And then we can dive into your story. Let's just talk about this incredible, incredibly important topic of teen suicide and what we can do. Thank you, doctor. It's, I really appreciate you having me on here today. It's a very, it's a tough topic for so many people. It's not an easy topic for me either because I've actually unfortunately lived through the death of my son. And I think it's important after losing Ryan, and to go back to the story, he was, he just turned 14 years of age. And my wife and I were on vacation celebrating her birthday. And it was three years ago in this March. He'd literally turned 14 and 10 days later decided to take his life. And I didn't see any of the signs. Mm. We didn't know there was anything wrong with Ryan. We knew that Ryan had Crohn's disease. We knew Ryan was a little grumpy. But we had three other older kids that were all grumpy. <laughs> and he was like the least grumpy from how I could see it. And we did not know what he was struggling with. And I didn't ask. Mm. That's the, the biggest thing that I want to get across to parents and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing is because mm -hmm. if you take a, a look at the life we led, he had a good life. At least from my perspective, he had a good life. You know, I'm, yeah. We don't have a lot of issues. We had a great family life. He lived in a very nice setting. I've been able to provide very well for my family. He wasn't needing anything. He had friends. He was the class clown. He was all those things. Now, he had little challenges, but I did not realize what he was struggling with inside mm. because I never asked how he was doing, Wow. how he was feeling. I never, I never thought to ask any of my kids about their mental health. It never crossed my mind. It wasn't something I ever did. And I, I look back now and I, excuse me, I, I'd ask him, you know, how, how are you doing? How, how are you feeling? How's your stomach? How's all the normal things? Like we, yeah. we, we own our kids' physical health, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Ryan struggled with Crohn's. It was, it was, it was a, he had a very bad case of Crohn's. Yeah. And so we're constantly worried about his physical health. Mm -hmm. And, but never once thought that we should be thinking about his mental health. And that, and that is the big challenge. I think that all parents or a lot of parents, yeah. there's more evolved parents than I am. So I, I'm going to say there's, there's definitely parents out there that are probably checking in on their kids, mental health. I, I didn't, I wish I did. So the thing that's, I've learned a lot. I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I'm not, I don't have your credentials. No, but you have lived experience and you've turned your lived experience into, and your parenting experience. And you talking about such an important angle because how we don't parents don't ask enough about our mental health of our children we just assume they seem okay but you so you've hit home on such an important topic so it's so important people hear then how do we rectify that what do we do what's the, so really it's it doesn't matter that you're not a therapist your contribution is probably more valuable so please well thank you i don't i don't think it's more valuable but i do think it's important for parents to to really pay attention to this Especially in today's day and age, with, with everything that we've gone through with COVID, when it first happened a year ago, which hard to believe was a year ago, kids were actually okay. Like the studies that came out were like, you know, it's March, April, May last year, and the kids are at home, they're sleeping in, they're with their families. Yeah. It's new, it's novel, but they didn't want to go to school anyway. So it's, and so it wasn't all that yeah. bad. Some missed their friends, but, you know, they figured it out. Now we're here, you know, a year and a bit into this, and the last five months have been horrendous. I mean, the stories that you're hearing that I hear about yeah. mental health, about parents and mental health, but everyone mental health. Mm -hmm. We have a mental health crisis like we've never had in this in across the world because mm -hmm. of this. And yeah. it's so important that we check in with each other and check in with, with our kids. I can tell you the, the stuff I've learned, if that's where you want to go with this. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do the stuff you've learned. That's why I wanted to interview you because I can give all the scientific and therapeutic and guidelines and things which are very important. But to you've learned a lot of lessons that I think are very identifiable for a lot of parents and everyone can benefit. So please go ahead. So one of the biggest mistakes that I made as a parent was how I showed up. So. Mm -hmm. 
My background is I'm a CEO of companies across the country that I own, my partners. I coach CEOs around the globe, an Iron Man guy, the black belts. I'm the guy who does all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I do all that stuff well, but I do all but that you stuff. you do it all, yeah. And so I show up in a lot of ways pretty big. And I show up as the guy who's going to fix everything. Yeah. Everything. I failed at 13 companies over the last 25 years that I've shut down at various stages. I've almost been bankrupt multiple times. But my family, my wife, my kids never knew any of that. Mm. I shielded them all from all that. Wow. So I was never the guy that came home with, it was a problem. There was never a problem. I solved everything. Wow. So when Ryan would see me, I always had a smile on my face. I was, on, I was always doing stuff. And I was always making stuff happen. And so that's how Ryan showed up. Because he took his cues from me. Yeah. In his mind. That's how a man should be. Mm. My kids never saw me cry. They never saw that side of me. I never really cried that much prior to Ryan. I'm a 53-year-old guy. I just, that's not the generation we didn't grow up that way. Mm-hmm. So Ryan saw me with my life always together and assumed that that's how he was supposed to be. And I guess when his life wasn't all together in his mind, yeah. he assumed there was something wrong with him. So the, the big thing I like to get across to parents is that, you know, it's okay to be vulnerable. So, I mean, here's, I was speaking to a group of so parents good. at Palm Springs a couple of years ago, prior to COVID, and they were all entrepreneurs, and they had, and there was kids in the audience, and I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. cow, there's, I don't usually speak with kids in the audience on this topic, mm-hmm. but they're there. So I had to think of something to say. I said, well, okay, I want to do, I want to run an exercise here. I want, I want all the parents to close their eyes, and I want all the kids to leave their eyes open. And I said, parents, I want you to put up your hand if you were ever bullied. You ever felt sad or depressed as a child? Think back to your 12, 13, 14 years of age. You ever were ashamed of your body? You ever felt like your friends weren't listening to you, like you had no friends? That you maybe didn't want to be here? So naturally, as you'd assume, all the hands went up. All the hands. Right? And the I'm kids, not surprised. No. Because we all had that, right? Yeah, everyone. Yeah. So the, the kids, I said, kids, just look around. Soak it in for a second. And the kids are looking, and the kids are shocked. Shocked. They yeah. thought they were alone, but they saw everyone else was in the same boat. Yeah. And so all the, all the parents had their hands up. And I said, okay, parents, keep your hands up if you ever shared those feelings with your kids. Those feelings of pain, of how you didn't like yourself when you were growing up. If you ever shared that with your kids, keep your hands up. Every single parent put their hands down. Every single parent. I, di- I didn't know what to expect. I expected somebody to put their hands up, but everyone put their hands down because wow. as parents, we want to protect our kids. Yes, absolutely. And we don't want anything to happen. We don't want them to feel pain. And so, and we don't want them to, and we don't want to relive those memories. Mm-mm. Right? You don't, exactly. You don't necessarily want to relive the memory of being bullied. Mm-mm. Right? Or, no, it's awful. It's tra- traumatic. And you don't want to share it because you're embarrassed by it. Mm-hmm. But that's what our kids need to hear is that you were bullied. You were ashamed of your body. Your friends did ditch you. And they need to know that that's normal. You were dumped by a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you hated it. And you're not perfect. Because when we do what I did, which gives the impression that everything's perfect and good, they feel like they're screw-ups because things aren't perfect and good. And some kids can handle it, but some can't. And, they're, and because it's hard to understand. And this point, I still don't understand, right? Because I am not a guy who gets depressed. So I don't truly understand what it's like to be depressed. But here's what I've learned from all my conversations with people on this topic in the last three years and through the movie that I made is that I'm never going to get it because the way they feel is I best describe it this way for people like me who've never been depressed is that it's a sunny, it's a sunny day outside. We're looking at the sky and it's a blue sky. It's a sunny, beautiful day. 
Mm-hmm. All they see is gray clouds. And I'm like, there's not a cloud in the sky. But they, all they see the gray clouds. They see gray clouds. They're never going to see life the way when you're fully depressed. It doesn't matter what I see. It's what they see. Mm-hmm. They see gray clouds. They don't see life the same way. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to be able to convince them. And you're not going to be able to convince them those gray clouds don't exist. Mm-hmm. Because they do exist in their mind. They do exist. You've got to validate that for them. Mm-hmm. And they need to know it's okay to see gray clouds. And that brings you to the next step. And what I've learned is that, you know, mm-hmm. I would be the guy. And I don't think I necessarily did this to Ryan because Ryan never complained. But with my other kids, well, life sucks because of this, this, and the other thing. Instead of allowing them to have the life sucks moment, I'm the guy going, your life sucks? Look around. Look where you live. Look what you get to do. Look at all the friends you have. How can your life suck? Your life doesn't suck. Let me tell you why your life doesn't suck. You, you want to talk about life sucking? Let me take you down to Mexico, to, and then we'll build a house, and I'll show you how people live. That's not helpful. <laughs> not at all. It seems so logical from that point of view, but it's not logical at all. No, because it's, it's just, it's really not helpful at all. Because the minute your child opens up to you and tells you that something is not right, if you go into fix-it mode, they're never going to talk to you about it again. Jason, you've just said such profound things that I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm just going to emphasize what you've said so that the listeners and viewers can get it. For 38 years, I have researched the mind-brain connection and I teach on the mind-brain stuff and I'm going to send you some books and things as well because you'll see all the understanding behind this. But one of the things that I tell every single person that ever listens to me, you'll see this all over my books, all over my social media, is you've got to, number one, experience, express your own emotions because you've got to see whatever you're going through as warning signals. They're clues. You have to be like detectives. So if we're seeing anything, it may not be depression, but it may be frustration, it may be irritation, it may be that we're suppressing stuff, or it may be that we don't allow ourselves to express emotions and we kind of go, whatever, whatever it is, how we are showing up is a clue of something that's going on. And I have these two images that I always use. And for those of my listeners that are just listening, I'm holding up my green tree and my toxic tree. And the, these represent thoughts in the brain. So every experience we have becomes a physical thought with substance made of proteins. So every experience we have, and we have around about eight thousand to ten thousand a day so from in the womb to the point at which whatever age you're at today you have every experience has become these thoughts now the point i'm making is that we have a mixture of healthy and toxic and they they trees they're actual trees in your brain and the roots are the source of so this discussion now is talking about whatever this is a thought tree about mental health this discussion is all the stuff we're talking about a teen suicide and your experience would go in the root section and the listener's interpretation would be the branches so those are all the memories so uh, this would be a toxic one so whatever person is experiencing the source, the root is is the source of the story. And then that's the interpretation. So when we invalidate someone's experience, when we say like, as and I've done it too, when you turn on to my own four kids and said, and I know this, I'm in this field. And I've even turned on when they've said things to me like, you know, life's terrible or whatever. I've also given that argument to, and I learned very early on that doesn't work. And applied my own teachings and science, but essentially when when a child has experienced something, this is what they have in their head. And we may not see it like that. We may see it like this, but for them, this is their experience. They had something that they interpreted. Now they see black clouds. They see gray clouds where we see sunshine. And those gray clouds are the warning signals for us as parents to actually say, okay, let's talk about those gray clouds. I can't see them, but I validate you. Let's now be thought detectives and see what does that look like in terms of all the signals and right down to the root story and help them in embrace, process and reconstruct. And that's kind of what I'm hearing you moving towards that we've got to be able to listen to our kids to help them process through. And I just threw this in at this point because my listeners and viewers know the science and I wanted to just help you as well because there's science behind what you are giving. The points you are giving are excellent and valid and there's solid science behind that and validating our kids and hearing them and and, and not doing what you said you shouldn't do, what you did, what you shouldn't do. And thank you for saying that. Thank you for being brave enough to say that because we've all made that mistake with our kids but we cannot make that mistake in future. We can help other parents not to. So mm-hmm. carry on. No, I thank you. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm just a guy who lost his kid. I, I, and that's a lot. That's a lot. Not just a guy who's lost his kids. That's a huge, huge thing. But I've yeah. spent four years in the space and talked to a lot of people about it. And I have some definite views on how we can change this. But so Love it, to it, hear them. Mm-hmm. It, 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 starts, it starts with us. So it's like, it's how you show up as a parent. It's how you have the conversation with your kids. It's, I, I like to tell parents this. If you're waiting for the government, a therapist, 
the schools, or your doctors to save your kids' lives? You're all going to be too late. I started an organization called ChooseLife.org. And I'm a, I'm a business guy. So first of all, it is the old anti-abortion site, which I didn't know when I bought it. But <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought that's what I wanted Ryan and people to do is to choose life over death. So that's why I did it. And yeah. I kept it because I'm like, well, that's still what I want to have happen. But the mission is to end teen suicide by the year 2030 because it's a big, hairy, audacious goal because that's what business guys do. And also because, look, it, I'm, I, it's a frustrating thing for me. Everybody wants to raise awareness about teen suicide. If you ask anybody, who, if everyone's aware of suicide, that goal has been achieved. Everybody knows aware about teen suicide. What about are we going to do about it? I love your thinking. I love where you're going with this. It's okay to be aware, but you've got to go beyond awareness and have action. We, we know, it, we, everybody knows it exists. We don't talk about it enough. We don't have the conversations. So I said, let's end it by 2030. And everybody's like, Jay, you're not going to end it by 2030. I know I'm not going to end it by 2030, but we can change it. Let's at least try to change it. Nobody said, let's raise awareness about COVID. That was not part of the goal here. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That was not part of the goal. Mm -hmm. We're all aware of it. Exactly. So how do you end teen suicide? Well, you don't rely on the rest of the world to do it for you. You don't rely on doctors. You don't rely on schools. You have to own your child's mental health the same way in which you own your child's physical health. And that's what we're missing as a society. Mm, I can't agree more. We're, we're, it's, it's all with parents. We have the control. We have the ability to change this. You have the ability to save your own kids by having the conversations. So what you're saying, if I may interrupt you, it's like putting a pebble in a pond. We in the, the middle and then that, that, that inner circle and then the school and the, and the government systems and the, you know, the, ther- the school, the therapists, the, the doctors, the government systems, those are the outer rings. But it starts with that inner ring, with us ourselves being honest and showing up how we show up ourselves as parents with our, expanding our own emotions to our kids so that they understand. It's one thing I tell people all the time is you've got to be able to explain. It's okay to be depressed or sad or angry. Tell your kids, I'm angry because I had a fight with mom because I had a, so that they see that this is normal and that this is what you're doing about it. And here's my solution. That's what we've got to teach our kids. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's life. Life is messy. And we've got to teach them how to grow, repair and grow in the mess. So I'm totally for you. It's got to be action steps. We've got to go beyond awareness and beyond. We're all aware. We're all aware of teen suicide. We've got to do the action steps. And I I love the rings analogy because it starts with us owning our Mm -hmm. child's mental health. And once we realize if we have a child who has mental health issues, then those outer rings come into play. Then we got to let the school know to pay attention. Then we got their doctor know to pay attention. Then we got to get a therapist involved. Then we got to get, and then it becomes everybody Bains working. And yeah, yeah. Saving that child. But it starts with us. It's not, you mm-hmm. can't be, you can't ignore it. If, you're, if your child came home from school and said they had a stomach ache, for the most part, you're not, if they're doubled over in pain, you're not going to ignore it. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So but we, don't, do ignore, we do ignore them crying in their room and say, get over it, it's fine. Jason, that's such an important point you've raised because for the last 40 years, there's been a massive emphasis at the detriment of society on the physical. And we've subsumed the medic, the mental into the physical. So we get what we call the biomedical model, which is looking at the brain and the biology, the physical side. And now when people are depressed, they're saying that that's the same as cancer. That's what the philosophy or, or diabetes. And that's been the philosophy for 40 years. And it's an incorrect scientific philosophy. And it's actually resulted up in the fact that people are dying 8 to 25 years younger than what they should. And that suicide rate has increased because what we've done is we've taken our mind, our mental health, which is 99% of us, and and the body's only 1%, and we've ignored that 99, and we've emphasized everything around the one. So we pay attention to the stomach ache, but we don't pay attention to the 99%. Why is there potentially the stomach ache? And there's more to the stomach ache than just the stomach ache and the crying in the room. So you raise a relevant point. You're calling attention to the 99%, which is your aliveness, your humanity, your story, your narrative, who you are, how you're experiencing it. And one more thing to go to the mental health aspect. Mental health, if you're a human and alive, you're battling with your mind in some way. No one's not battling. It's just different for different people. It shows up differently for everyone's narrative. So like your other three kids and you and your wife, there's your own mental health issues dealing with the pain of the loss of you talk about a fractured family. And these other kids that may not go towards suicide, but they may be very depressed and have eating disorders or whatever. So mental health affects everyone and we have to pay attention to the narrative, not to the physical. We've got to stop saying it's a mental disease, which it's not. It's not a neuropsychiatric brain disease. You're not broken. It's not something to be ashamed of. You're human experiencing life and life is tough. And that's the narrative we've got to start bringing forward to our children. And it starts with us as, as parents and adults. 
being honest about our own stories. We've got to all put our hands up, not keep them down. It's, I, I think it's the same as people are going to have a stomach ache, people are going to have a headache, people are going to have an arm ache, and people are going to have bad days. Exactly. And, and sometimes those bad days lead to worse days, and sometimes that stomach ache leads to you know, appendicitis. And we just have to pay attention to what's happening and watch the signs. And we have to have the conversation. And this is where parents have a really hard time is that when kids turn 13, 14, 15 years of age, they lock down. We all did, right? We just yeah. don't, we don't want to talk to our parents. Our parents aren't smart. Their parents aren't blah, 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 blah. I want to be with my friends. I, I don't. Why are, you, why are you putting all these rules and restrictions on me? And so a lot of parents have a really hard time talking to their kids. And, you know, I, I did from time to time, too. I'm, there was, I mean... But I, I can tell you that you have to find a way to talk to them. And I can tell, yeah. you, how, I can tell you how not to do it. It's, it's easier to tell you how not to do it than it is to tell you how to do it. Well, that's so good. And before you dive into that, third, did you know that the age 13 to 18 is the most difficult life cycle in the entire, the diffi- most difficult part of the entire human life cycle? It's so 13 moment. to 18. And there was a massive survey done where they asked that age group, what is the most important thing you want from your parent? A very famous study. And they, you know what they said? For our parents just to listen to us. They said they don't want rules. They don't want. They said we don't even mind the rules, but we don't want to be talked at. We want to be heard. We just want to be heard. We want our parents to sit there and listen and validate our experiences. So, what you're saying is scientific. So, go ahead and tell us what not to say. Well, it's not so much what not to say; it's how you do it, right? So, how you do it? Yeah. I know it's your house. I know you own it. I know you pay for it. I know you pay for everything in the house. Mm -hmm. But that room that they live in is all they have. That's their sacred space. Mm. So when you barge into that room and say you want to talk to them, you just entered their sacred space. And that's why they shut down until you get that, get out. And that's why they don't talk to you in that room. Wow, that's very powerful. Mm, that's very powerful. That's theirs. That's all they have. Mm. They didn't pay for it, but they own that little space. And nobody wants to be barged in on their sacred space. Wow. So talking to your kids is about finding the right time to do it. And it's, and it's different for everybody. Like for Ryan and I, we would talk. We wouldn't talk about mental health, obviously, but we, we talked. We'd watch a movie at night, and, and then we'd talk in, in the dark room by ourselves after the show was done. And that was our time to talk. I thought we were having good conversations, and we were, but they just weren't deep enough. You know, it might be Kim would always find time talking to kids. We lived 20 minutes away from their schools and driving them home. Or on the way to school would be, you know, one would want to talk on the way to school, one would want to talk on the way back. Mm-hmm. There's, you all know when your kids are willing to talk to you when they're not. Mm-hmm. They might be, you take them for a walk, you take them to the golf course, whatever you might do, right? Mm-hmm. There's that time when they just open up. Let them talk and listen. That's mm-hmm. all they want. Just listen to them. I just want to be listened to. And it's not, and, and what they're saying is going to make any sense. What they're saying isn't logical. What they're saying you know isn't real. Just listen. Just so listen. Good. Tell them it's, it's okay. Yes, mm. you should not. So good. Yes, there's more fish in the, in the sea. And when that girlfriend or boyfriend breaks up with you, it's easy to say, don't worry, there's another one coming around. You, trust me. They, they're not seeing that right now. No. Right? They're not, they, don't, they don't want to hear that. That's, that's they just not. want an empathetic, uh, empathic ear. They want to listen. They want the comfort of the parent's warmth. And non judgment, and just so I'm safe, I can talk to you, I can cry, I can express this emotion. And if we stop that, we are teaching them how to suppress. And when you suppress these, these are real. They're as real as the COVID virus. They, COVID's made of protein, these are made of protein. And if that child experienced that breakup, that's the source, this is the interpretation. By talking it, they're getting it out, they process it. If they suppress it, they're going to transmit that in some way, physically or suicide or whatever. So if, over time, we, we need to let them get it out to enable them to make sense of it. Because in getting it out, you and weaken it and there's all the neuroscience behind that too so you're so right so just just stop everything you have in your just bite your tongue just give love them a hug that. Give them love them. and afterwards you go talk to your husband or wife and go well i was crazy <laughs> and, I <just> <laughs> <tell them. laughs> and i know and i understand this, this the problems in your life are so much more serious they are we have mm-hmm. real problems. We're trying to keep families, bills paid and all this stuff. And maybe you employ people. Maybe you're a doctor. Yeah. Your, lives. Your, your problems are bigger, but not to them. 
No, not to them. Their problems, they're an expert on their own. Everyone is an expert on their own experience. So for any of us to look at someone and say, in our eyes, it doesn't seem so bad, you invalidate them and invalidating causes suppression and tremendous trauma too. So you're so right. It is so vital that we don't profess. And I know it's a good intention. As parents, you want to, as you said earlier on, you want to bubble wrap them. You want to take the pain. You want to say, it's not so bad. Here's how you can fix it. But they actually kind of have to get into that mess in order to repair and grow. And that study, that survey also said, and from my experience, all my years of working in this field and having four kids is they will tell you when they want advice. We need to wait for that point. And I don't know if you're going to bring that up, if that was one of the things. But when you've listened, there is a point where they'll start asking. But if you, if you've got to only give advice when they start asking, because then they're ready to hear, you know, and it's, and it's got to be done in such, I don't know if you found that with your experience too. Well, I've gotten better at it. You know, 27 years of marriage, I finally realized that my wife doesn't want me to tell her what to do. She wants me just to listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and, and I'm a, I guess I'm a little slow that way. But that's most men, right? We, we yeah. want to fix things. Yes. But when, when they want advice, they'll tell you. When your wife wants advice, when your husband wants advice, when your kids want advice, when anybody wants advice, they, they will, will tell you. you. They will tell you. If they're not asking for advice, they don't want advice. Exactly. They just want, to, want you to listen to it. And all the stuff we're talking about right now can apply to your spouse, can apply to your friends. It applies to everybody. It's not just teens. It's everyone. It's everybody, right? It's, mm. it's buying the right time. And, and when they want to talk, just let them talk. Cancel, the phone, yeah. got, cancel the meeting you got, just let them talk. Yeah, when they're on a roll, cancel everything. And don't be shocked. That's one of the things I always tell my parents as well is that, listen, if they, they let them tell you everything, even if it's stuff that you cannot believe they're telling you. If you don't create that safe space for them to talk where they feel they can tell you anything about anything, they're going to go and learn lessons about life from the wrong places. But if they feel they can come to you with everything, and it's hard to get to that. And, and there are some things that they aren't going to come to you with, and that's okay. But it is not to judge and not to show shock and not to whatever, just to let them get it out and feel safe to tell you absolutely anything and everything absolutely and it's important for you to for everybody to understand and i didn't know this either that if they're sounding and and feeling they sound like they are seriously depressed and they're upset and there's this it's the right thing to do to ask them if they ever thought of hurting themselves yes i thank you for bringing that up Jason has just said an incredibly important point. If your kids are in a very bad emotional state and you've noticed a behavior change and it's been consistent, it is very important that you do bring up, have you ever thought of hurting yourself? Ask them that question because you're also validating and help them make meaning out of it because they're trying to, the thought of trying to hurt yourself. One of my, my patients once said to me, it was like, it's like being on the 21st floor, 20th floor of a burning building and the burning, the building is burning. You can either get burnt or you can jump off. There's like no option. And that's what it feels like when a person's at that point of suicide. But by someone listening and asking, you can then, oh, maybe there's another way out. Maybe there's a helicopter that can come and get me out of the building. And that's so asking the question enables a person to make mean, to start finding some sort of meaning behind it. And it's also validating. And it's so, and, and Jason, I don't mean to interrupt you and, and, and at all, but then, and I don't know if you're going to mention this, but when you ask them, it's so important that you they don't feel judged and you don't immediately say, you can't do that. It's wrong. Because the minute you come with that, the guilt will come. And guilt is is a trigger because they don't want to hurt you as a parent. They also don't want to hurt themselves. They just don't know what to do. You know, So you don't want to lay a guilt on and you can't do this. For them, it is an option at that moment. It may not be the next option. Obviously, it's not the option you want. But by getting it out in the open, there's a chance to process and make meaning out of it and look at alternative options. But you can't take that away from them because that's where they're at at the moment. But by talking about it, you can get it out. Does that, does that kind Absolutely. of make sense? And I, and I think, you know, from, from everything I've learned is that, you know, we think as parents that if I bring up suicide, I'm putting a thought in their head. They all know about it. 95% of people have had suicidal thoughts at some point, if not often, in their life. That's a large percentage. Wow. So we're not putting it in their, in their heads. And if, if they say they've thought about it, you, you, like the doctor said, you can't judge them. You, can, you just got you to listen and say, well, when and how and how often? And you've got to get the gathered. Now you're, ga now you're in data gathering mode. Yeah. And the most important question you can ask is, do you have a plan? How were you going to do this? When were you going to do this? If they don't have a plan, you have some time. Yeah. You need to get them help, but you have some time. Mm -hmm. If they have a plan and they say, yes, I was going to kill myself on Thursday, or I thought I would kill myself on Wednesday last week, 
And I was going to do it this way. And then we need to get them to a doctor. We need to get them to the hospital. We need to get them to a therapist. We need to we therapist, need to yeah. right away because it's serious. If they don't have a plan, then we can we can get it's a, it's not as serious, but it's still serious. I mean, mm-hmm. is that the right way to look at it? Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with you. When If there's a plan in place, get them to a therapist. They need to talk through and family therapy, individual therapy. Your child might turn around to you and say, I want to be in that therapy alone. I don't want you in there. And don't be offended by that. Never be offended if your child feels, because they don't want to hurt you. They want they want to keep you protected. Always remember that there's this incredible need for a child to also protect their parents, which is interesting. So I would definitely get them to a safe space. I would hesitate to say immediately call the police because they are not trained in mind and they'll, it's very scary the psych system the psych system will lock them up and, and that increases chances of suicide it's way better to get to a compassionate therapist to get into family therapy to get a support system in place to start asking them what do you need right now we're going to get you a therapist but what do you need for us to help you process through this and what do you need right now is a very important question and they may not may say i don't know what i need when they said you we love you we want to do everything we can how can we help you and as you prompt them they they may not be able to express it and that's where it's very important like at that moment that you get a therapist that can that you can talk it through and get your child to that therapist they may you may have to take them there initially. You may have to get a therapist to come to your house. You may have to do, there's so much online therapy now, which is fantastic that you can immediately, but don't leave it for an hour. Do it now. Do it now, yeah. yeah. And, 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 if, and if you can't get someone, then you need to take them to the hospital. You need to say, get a family support system. Yeah, get, a, get, get to, if you can't, yeah, if you can't get that, get them to the hospital, but there's going to be a lot of other implications there that you need to make sure as a parent you understand what is involved in that. You have to do something. You have to do something. You can't leave it. You can't just let your child go back to the bedroom and leave them alone. Because yeah, we'll, there may we'll be. A... Get, we'll get back to this tomorrow. It doesn't work at that point. Mm-mm. No, you have to do something at that moment. And another thing that's important, Jason, and I'm sure you can speak to this too, is to stay calm. It's inside you may be inside you may be an absolute wreck, and you will be. Because to hear your child say that would be is the most devastating thing. But you need to stay calm on the outside because you are their link to sanity at this stage. You're their link to calmness. If they see fear in your eyes, it's going to tip them over the edge too. So as far as possible, I know this is probably one of the hardest things for a parent to do. You have to stay as calm as you can. And that's, you know, there's a lot of different things you can learn to do as a parent to help yourself train yourself to be calm. And, and I think as you go through this whole the therapy route, let's just say now we, we realize we have a child who's, who's got a problem. It's not an immediate problem and they need therapy. Yeah. It's not about checking a box. I found a therapist. You've got to make sure they like that therapist. Oh, well, absolutely. Make, you might have to go through five, six, seven therapists. Excellent. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, I mean, look, they're not all created equal and they're not all, there's not being a natural connection with someone. Exactly. And you have to make sure that you stay on top of that. Is is your child talking to the therapist? Do they feel like they can be open with their Are they happier when they come back from therapy? Are they looking forward to going back and talking to that person? If they're not, then find them somebody else. Exactly. That is so important. Therapy is something that everyone needs. And it's a really good thing. And it's one of the things that that I would love to change in this country is that people actually had act. They didn't make it so difficult because it's, there's always the financial component. Therapy is expensive. And that this should be something that is supported by insurance and the state, et cetera, et cetera, because everyone's battling. And we, if we had more community access to immediate, like if you, your child's, if you could just go to your local community center and know that, okay, I can go and get help there immediately, we would reduce suicide, mental health issues overnight. Because we, we've made it so difficult to access in the way this country is structured that not everyone can even afford to go to a therapist. Okay. And that's the terribly sad part. And, and there's something I think that all parents need to understand. Everybody needs to understand, I think, and I didn't. Dr. Goulston, who was in my, in my movie, made a really good point to me the other day. He said, Jay, people don't want to die. They want the pain. Pain to go away. That's all. If you, if you speak to a suicide survivor, which I've spoken to many, mm-hmm. they will say exactly that. That they just want the pain to go away. Absolutely, and that and that's the biggest thing, and that and that gives as a parent, as a friend, as a spouse, that should give you a little bit of sauce. The fact that it's not about that they don't want to die. Mm. So when you bring it up, they will talk to you. But in most cases, when you ask them how they're feeling, they will tell you they're not going to hide because they don't want to do it. 
No, they want to be listened to. They want things to make sense. They don't make sense. And when you can talk to a parent who you know loves you, you get perspective. When you talk to a therapist, you get perspective. You know, when you're looking at life through a toxic view, you can't see anything. You know, mm-hmm. these are the black clouds. But when you start hearing people start talking to you, you start getting perspective. You can start looking at things from different angles. Mm-hmm. And when you're in that place where you just want the pain to go away, there's just no perspective at all. And that's why you're quite right. When people, when you start talking, when you listen and you just let them talk, they're looking for that kind of perspective to help them see things differently. And I think it's really important as we go through this, just to bring up the conversation. But when I was, when I was 14 versus Ryan was 14, right? Look at, it wasn't so bad. We didn't, the suicide rates among kids were at, when I was 14 years of age were almost non-existent. I mean, they existed, but they're nowhere near what they are now, right? And exactly. you can find your exact numbers. I, I yeah, don't. yeah, you're quite right. Yeah. And it's one every eight seconds, literally, that's people are committing suicide. That's in general, but it's, it is, it's much more, it definitely yeah. has. So, so Jason, this is where you've done a lot of sort of investigation yourself and, and in terms of teen, teen suicide. So why, why do you feel there's a difference and how does this go towards the action steps that you have in your goal? So I, I, it's, 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 it's obvious and clear to me that as technology ramped up, as Facebook ramped up, as Instagram ramped up, so did teen suicide. When I was a kid, and I talked about one, in one of my TEDx talks, the Hot Lava Talk, I talked about... The I perfect. watched it. It's great. Thank you. Look, at I, there were two TV channels, and then we went outside and played and, and we were connected as a family, right? There was nothing. We, I didn't watch the news. There was no news to watch. I mean, dad would watch the news. I'd walk by it. And it was I, at a specific time, wasn't it? I mean, you'd watch the news at 7 o'clock, o'clock or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right? There's a, and, and you think about like that, that. I was insulated from, from the world. There were, there were wars. There were things going on. I don't know what the, I can I have no memory of any of it. I have memory of going out and playing with my friends. I have memory of getting yelled at by my dad. I have memory of that kind of stuff, right? But that was my life. I didn't know what was going on in the world, and I didn't have all this extra. So you take a kid today who's got the anxiety of losing their girlfriend, their boyfriend, their friends not paying attention to them, and then there's COVID, mm. and there's a war over here, and there's that over here, and all that stuff is circling around their heads. Mm. And then they're on Instagram, and, and, and I used to go home, and my, my bedroom was a, my, my special spot no one could bug me in. I get bullied at school, but when I was home, I'm safe. They're not safe at home because of, of, of Instagram, of Facebook, of Twitter. And everybody's a bully now. When mm-hmm. I grew up, the bullies were big, right? Mm-hmm. They'd pick you up and they'd throw you in a trash can. And, and you always knew who the bully was. It was very, very clear who the, bullies was, who the bully was. Now, as you said, everyone's a bully. That's a very interesting statement. Everybody can be a bully. Not everybody's a bully, but everybody can be a bully. The littlest person on the planet who would never be a bully ever can be shy at school and a bully online. They have a different persona because that's who they want to be online because they don't like being bullied in person. It's like a bully people online. It's it's the whole bullying thing is is real. And so kids are not Uh as nice to each other as they we'd like them to be. Mm. We're not as nice to each other. I mean, we get in rants on Facebook. We're terrible at it as a Terrible. Adult. Yeah, it's created a, a sense of I can say what I want and I can be rude and things that you wouldn't do face to face. It's created an environment where people can be toxic. And, and, and just look at the elections, look at everything that's been going oh. on, and how divided racism. Country, how divided a country we are. Mm. So you take that and you think, oh, those kids have to process that. And you as a parent, us as parents, have to help them process it. Because my mind at 14 could never process all that, all no, that stuff. So how no. are they? they then I mean, you raise such a valid point, Jason. Here you in the most difficult cycle of your life, 13 to 18. Hormones are crazy. It's just impossible. Everything, it's almost like, you know, wire that's uninsulated. That's what they like. If you go touch an uninsulated wire, you get a shock. It's, it's like everything's just so much. And then on top of it, as you say, you don't have the, you don't have the metacognitive skills yet because you're still in a process of development to deal with all these adult things and the amount of stimulation, which is technology's board as well. It's, you know, we, we, we just, there's just so much of it. So that the ability to watch a bit of TV, go outside and play, it's not happening. The ability to just be quiet and daydream, it does not happening. People 16, there's, there's studies showing that people can't even sit for 16 minutes and just daydream. Whereas 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we would sit for hours and just under the tree and just play with boxes and stones and daydream. And that's gone away. And that's a massive part of what you're talking about as well. And I, I don't even know how much the, I mean, make believe doesn't happen as much anymore because we have virtual reality. And I don't know how much that, and I, there's, I want oh, to that plays a big role. I mean, our ability to have make believe friends and make believe games versus everything's right in front of us and we don't have to use our minds to have any make believe. I don't know how that, 
I don't know how. The, yeah, that is changing because it's a different way that we use our mind. It's not as deep. So there's different ways. It's got its benefits. There's definite benefits of technology and the, you know the virtual reality. But it's when it's too much of it, it it, it, mis- it damages the the mind and the brain because the mind and the brain are separate. So we're processing through the mind and the brain is used to. So it does change the way that the brain functions and it doesn't allow for enough processing time, which affects all the energy levels and functionality of the brain. So if, if it's balanced, if we still combine that with read a book and imagine and sit outside and just visualize and daydream, I mean, I literally teach people how to daydream again. I mean, that's like something unheard of. Think of that. Teaching people to daydream. You and I grew up. That was part of our, you just did it. It wasn't even, a, you didn't I, even I think about it. I spent every classroom hour daydreaming. <laughs> Like there's no chance to daydream now. That's a big issue. So that's creating a lot of in that time for for everyone, it's a problem. But for the teenager who is in that developmental stage, that very important, difficult stage of brain development and mind-brain integration, that's a huge additional problem that's being laid onto them. So you quite right, you ended off when I interrupted you there, you were saying that you didn't as a 14 year old weren't able to process that you didn't have to, but now our 14 year olds do have to. So what do we do? Well, we have to have the conversation with them. You have to, if, if they have an Instagram account, if they have a Facebook account, look at, you own that phone. You need to have access to it. You need to look at it. And, and you need to say, look, at, if you have a fake account, I need to see it. You can't, and if I catch you with a fake account, I'm taking everything away from you. Because we need to be able to talk about all this stuff. And they are smarter than you are when it comes oh, to yeah. So you need to research how they create fake accounts and what they do and how they hide stuff on their phones. I can't tell you how to do it, but I know it's all online, so you can figure it out. But here's the big thing that I think you need to think about. I gave Ryan a phone at 12 years of age because he was a good kid, great grades, never did anything wrong. I, there was no reason not to give him a phone. He wanted a phone. His friends had phones. I didn't realize the reason I shouldn't have given him a phone. And it wasn't social media. He wasn't really on social media. I, I showed him how to be on Facebook. He followed me on Facebook because I would post stuff about our dinner conversations and he would he liked that part. But he didn't really have a Facebook friends or he didn't do anything social media wise. But I gave him a phone and I essentially said to Ryan, I said, without saying, I said, Ryan, here you go. You can go anywhere in the world, research anything you want to research. And I'm able to ask you where you went and what you did. Everything in the world is on the internet on that phone. And I just gave him access to everything in the world. People think that porn is the worst thing on the internet. It's not a good thing, but it's not the worst thing. There's a lot of bad things on the internet. Mm. And your kids, if you do not ask, if you do not control the browser on your child's phone or your child's computer, they're going to go there and they're going to figure it out. And candidly, Brian used that phone to research how to kill himself. Mm, I was going to say that now, these how many sites they are. Okay. And that's what he did. And I know he did it. Because he wrote a letter about it. Wow. So. He wrote a letter to you. Uh-huh. Wow. About all the research he did on the ways he would do it. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. So I personally don't think that a 12 or 13-year-old kid needs to have a phone that has a browser on it. Can they mm-hmm. take pictures? Can they listen to music? Can they phone you? Can they text their friends? Sure. But if you have a browser on that phone... You should take limits it on it. Limit it, take it off. But I mean, there's software out there that does it. I just don't think they need it. I don't think kids that are, you, you have to be 16 to drive. Why can you be, why, why can we make a change the birth date and have a 10 year old with a Facebook and Instagram account? I think big tech has a bigger responsibility to make sure that children are not on their, on their sites. They're not going to do it because, candidly, they make too much money having too many kids on their site. And you are so right. You are so right. So, look at. There's a lot being said about big tech and all the things they're doing, and and but the biggest thing they're not doing is protecting our kids. You're quite right. So we're going to have to do that job. Yeah, I mean, should we all band together and tell them? Absolutely. We should. I was asked this question in an interview the other day. Shouldn't we exactly what you've just said now? Should we not be challenging big tech? And they're aware of it. They are very aware. And you, you've you just said it too. They know. But you're quite right. We have an age limit for drinking, an age limit for driving. There's a reason because between 13 and 18, your brain is a basic 
chemical stew. It's like everything's settling down, everything's over overreactive. And that's where we need to be listening so that we can guide and giving them access to the world where they can search how to kill themselves. And there's so many sites with that. And, and you know, when you brought that up, I was going to bring that up and you brought that up and, and, and Ryan wrote your letter. That's, and you can't blame yourself for that because you cannot go through the guilt, but we, we can learn from that. And we have now in an era where that's different. We don't have to, we can have limits on that. I agree with you. The browsers control the browsers, put an age limit on. We have to, and yes, we can band together. We do have voice as parents. We do have the voices to, to make this change. Well, and, and, and look at, you've got, you, you've got to teach your kids. Like I always had a thing before my kids went to college. I want to make sure they drank with me because they're going to go drinking by themselves. I want to make sure they learn how to drink and learn how to do it responsibly so that they're not going to be a, a friggin' mess in college. That's such a, such an important point you just said. So, so if they're going to have an Instagram and a Facebook account, teach them how to have a Facebook account and an Instagram account. Teach don't them assume. To, yeah. Don't just, just don't assume they're going to figure it out. I, it comes back to exactly where we started with this whole thing is that mm -hmm. my message to parents is if, if you want to save your kids, you have to own their mental health. And that's what this is oh, really. Good. And in the process of me learning all about this, I did a couple of TEDx talks. I did a goal cast. They're all on the choose site. And I did a movie and I did a movie. Yeah. Tell us about your movie. I, I did a movie because I was going through Ryan's drawers a couple of weeks after he passed. And I was just, you, you do, you, you go in the room. Yeah. You're looking for stuff. So I opened the top drawer and there was two sticky notes. One said, here's my username and passwords. The other said, tell my story. Oof. Sorry. I mean, so the movie is yeah. called tell my story. And it's basically me going around the Western United States, talking to parents and kids and trying to understand teen suicide. Everyone needs to watch it. I've watched the trailer. I haven't watched the full one yet. I'm going to watch it. But it's it's his partner, Jason Reed, partnered with Cinema Libra. And this is the li link is in the show notes. Oops, he just jumped here. Let me just get this. In the production of Tell My Story, A Father's Journey to Understand Teen Suicide. The film was released on PBS on March 20, 23rd, 2021, and will be streaming free for 90 days. And then there's a link. See, is it still streaming free? It's, stream it's streaming free for probably another, gosh, almost another couple of months. And then it, it is available on Cinema Libre's site. And we should put that link in there too. The internationally, you won't be able to get it on PBS, but you okay, will. So, be able to, you, so will you give get, me both. You give me both links because these, yeah, we'll this, yeah sure. this this will be watched way after it's you know end yeah. as well. And, it, and it'll be streaming on Cinema Libre for until whenever it's going to be there for all. Oh, that's incredible. And, and I'm just going to read this in the film where we both recompose ourselves. In the film, Jason uncovers painful truths about the lives of teens, the impact of unfettered access to the internet and social media, and the shocking rise of depression amongst America's youth. The journey brings him together with young suicide survivors, prevention experts, and parents trying to understand the 70% increase in adolescent suicide. And then you also talk about closer to home with his family fractured. He examines his son's technology use to discover what no parent wants to find. So there you share your story to tell people break a cycle. We can break the cycle. We can come together as parents and, and support each other and break that cycle. Yep. And you've turned your pain and, and into helping others to become aware of this. And as you say, it's not just awareness. You said that, and I'm so glad you raised that you've gone beyond awareness. You're actually doing something. And I would like to, on this podcast, say I'll support you in any, any way that I can to get this message out, because this is also unbelievably close to my heart and part of what I do in my work too. So wherever we can do stuff, joint talks, doing whatever, I will do anything to help change the situation as well and give people the action steps. Because you said some so many profound things, but I think what hit me the most was you, well, everything hit me the most, but what was very, in terms of what do we do next is what are the practical steps? And to have that goal, end teen suicide by 2030, I don't even think it's unrealistic. I think it's incredibly, incredibly important that we have a fixed goal and now we can have create action steps to get there. And you've done this film, you're doing talks, Talks, it's educating people. When people have knowledge and education of this is what you can do, you've given a multitude of practical steps in this interview. You've given a multitude of practical steps that, that we can, through our 
platform get out to a whole lot of people. And I would love to do another conversation with you and, and, and do a part two where we really say, okay, these are the action steps. This is what, this is step one, step two, step three. This is where you can get involved. So what you can do, you know, put it out there to parents and, and expand whatever you and I can talk about this offline and see what we can anything that i can do with you and i appreciate everything you're doing all the all the research your life's work is in this and it's people like you that are making a huge difference i'm just trying to help the way i just you're making a huge difference to you touching lives and i know this is going to touch so many people's lives you've spoken to so many people so many people's hearts so jason just in closing because i I think we'll do a part two this is a good place to to stop and do a part two and let's what in in interesting closing let's do two things first of all where can people get hold of you and i know you've mentioned about the film we'll put all the links in the show notes but if they want to know more Go to choosefelife.org and there's a link to get reach me. And I can't remember the email address off the top of my head because I have so many. But but choosefelife.org is easy to remember. And you can see the TEDx talks, the Goalcast. The Goalcast is a great place to start. The Hot Lava Talk is another good one to go to. And the movie, obviously, is something. Yeah. Look at Just have the conversation with your kids. Just start talking. Yeah, that's what I that's think. So, that would be what would be your final advice to people to, at this stage, at this point? Own your kids' mental health the same way you own their, their, their physical health and start the conversation. And listen. Listen and be vulnerable and tell them how your life really was. And tell them your life isn't great because they need to hear that. And how you've managed that. That's not great. The stuff that's not great. What did you do to manage it? How, you, how did you process through? Absolutely. Because we all process through it, we all get through it, we all work through it. And they need the skill set to figure out how to get through it. And by hearing how you get through it, you're teaching them how to get through it. Exactly. Without telling them how to get through it, tell them how you get through it. It's, they'll, they'll respond more to you telling about your experience and how you got through it than you telling them this is your experience, this is how you must get through it. So it's got to start from your vulnerability, that middle of the pond, and how you got through it, and then listen to them. And then as you listen to them, they will take what you've taught them, plus your listening, and then they'll ask you the right questions, and then you'll know how to give the right answers. Absolutely. Thank you, Doctor. I really appreciate Thank you. today. Thank you, Jason. This was incredible. Thank you for being so vulnerable. Thank you for sharing the insight. I know you're going to help thousands and thousands of people. And I look forward to talking again. I look forward to connecting. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you.